you know, it would be great if, for a lot of people, that uh, somehow they could figure out a way to have the end justify the means. You know, to be able to just go ahead and do what you want to do and get away with doing it when you want to do it, how you want to do it, the way you want to do it, as you do it, by doing what seems right in your own eyes. Now, if it wasn't for the Bible, we could probably get away with that in religion, but there's a time in the Old Testament, bummer, where they did that which was right in their own eyes. They uh, kind of like tried to get away with kind of doing their own thing. And you know, it's possible to do the right thing, but with the wrong intention. Or the wrong thing with the right intention. You know, they, they kind of mix it up, you know, like, it seems like a good idea, you know, to just go out and, you know, do things, you know, to be busy about, you know, doing religious things. You know, kind of like, you should go to church, so rather than go, like, maybe if God says Sunday, go Sunday, or, you know, whatever day of the week you choose to go. If you don't pray about it, hey, you know, you might just start going Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. you know, I did, but that was a different story. But the point is, you might get overboard, or you might want everyone to do the same things that you're doing, and you won't tolerate anyone doing any other thing, like what God may be telling them to do. But what you're doing is really not listening to what the Lord's telling you, are you? Because, you see, it's easy to go ahead and just do what you think's right. You know, you kind of think it up here, you know, and you kind of gurgitate it, and you kind of mix it up, and you kind of, you know, you get in your Bible, and you read it, and, you know, and you kind of like... You know, or you do your iPad thing where you go... You know, and you zip through the Bible, and you go... I got it. Or you do Barnes Notes, you know, and you get this little kind of cheat sheet on the side, you know, where it says, hey, thus saith the Lord, you know, <laughs> and you've got all these little rules and regulations all nailed down, you know, about what the true Christian is. Well, unfortunately, yeah, or fortunately, God intervenes. Huh. Because people will take something that sounds religious, that looks religious, that might even be good for you, and make it religious rather than something that God wants to use to inspire you to know Him. You see, the purpose, lots of times, designates the tool you're going to use. Like, if I was going to build a house, let's just say I was going to build a house, you know, I'd probably draft it first, you know, meaning that I'd make up some plans, you know. Although I have helped build a log cabin one time with a buddy of mine that, you know, we just cut down some poles, you know, lodgepole pine, and we did notch them right, you know, and we shaved off the bark, you know, we got it so that it stretched and all that stuff, and we built, you know, a cabin, you know, and it was decent, you know, I mean, it, it survived winters, you know. And I remember one time that I was, you know, trapped so to speak, actually I was abandoned by my buddy, but I was stuck up 7,000 feet high, you know, up in the, up on the Lookout Ridge, up in Oregon, you know, and a snowstorm was coming in and I needed to build something in a hurry, so I built a little kind of like cabin, you know, and had a little hole for my fire, you know, I built a primitive, you know, fire and left a kind of like a chimney flap, you know, so I could keep the heat in, but at the same time I could still warm up the area I was sleeping in because I was stuck there for weeks, for a while, till my food ran out, my gas ran out. I still had my chainsaws, you know, all three of them. But another snowstorm was coming, so I kind of figured, you know what, if my buddy isn't coming up, I'm walking out of here. So I buried my chainsaws and walked out. When I got to town, I was mad. We left the chainsaws buried there till we got, you know, later on in the spring and came and dug them up and they were fine. But the point of it all is, is that if I was going to build a house, I would want to use the right tools for it. I wouldn't want to build it with a chainsaw. You know, it's kind of like it just doesn't work quite the way you think it would. <laughs> Although it can be done. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> hmm. A lot of work. But 
you sit down and you, you make your plans. You know, you've got your, you know, you build your framework. You know, you've got your boards. You got your lumber list. You know, you kind of, if you're an electrician, you know, you're going to build it with electrical supplies. You know, you're going to lay out the electrical, you know, schematics. You know, and you're going to do all the things. You know, maybe to code if you're in a city. Maybe not if you're like in the bush in Alaska. But you know, you're going to build something that has at least some structure to it, some way of doing it. So if you build it with a frame, you know, you might want to get like, you know, a framing hammer because you see. There are different kinds of hammers, and each different kind of hammer is used for a different purpose. You know, a, a roofing hammer has a heavy, heavy end on it. You know, you can just whop, 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 and you can sink nails, you know, 16 pennies, whatever, it doesn't matter. You can sink those nails, you know, no problem when you're roofing with a roofing nail. When you got a framing hammer, it's a little bit different. You know, it's a little narrower, it's a little bit more finite. You know, it's kind of kind of nice. I like my framing hammers, you know. but Craftsmen have their own tools that they use in order to use them specifically for a purpose. And that's kind of what God does when he's got a purpose in mind, when he's trying to tell somebody something. He knows, according to his own planning, what he wants to use and what he wants done. But sometimes people get carried away when they want to use something he didn't intend to, and they go ahead and use a chainsaw where maybe a framing hammer might have been a better thing to do, or you know, a skill saw. Because I don't know about you, but you know, I have taken a chainsaw and I've cut two by fours. It can be done. It can be done craftsmanship too. But you know, you really want to have a finer blade on that chainsaw if you're going to do it for cutting two by fours than just ripping it apart. Because <laughs> you get splinters <laughs> everywhere. But the point of it is this. What the tool is designed for and what the purpose is designed for is according to the planning and the reason why you're using that tool. God does that with people. He doesn't necessarily want you running off and doing your own thing because you really don't know what the purpose is for. You think you know. You think you got it down. But then you get there and you kind of go, you scratch your head and you go, well, you know, now that I'm here, I better wing it. And that's what happens when Sometimes you see contractors get into a job, you know, and then they kind of like, you know, do a little fast shuffle. Well, you know, we're an inch short, so we'll shimmy it. You know, we're not quite level, so we'll just smack it a few times. You know, you've seen those things happen, I'm sure. All of us have done them at some point in time. You know, it's like, well, we'll toward the page, you know, flip the page real quick. It doesn't work that way with God. You see, God does know what he wants to cause to grow. And a lot of things happen according to his timing. A lot of things happen according to his purpose. A lot of things, believe it or not, happen according to his design. And he knew that you were going to get involved. So knowing that you didn't know what you were doing, sometimes he has it designed that way so that you might be a part of something bigger than you are. You might not always see the big picture and may only know the small part that you fit in. But the purpose and the design of having plans is to once in a while take a look at them. You know, when I was working, I often would have to go back and look at the design. You know, kind of like, well, okay, wait a minute, what are we doing here again? And look at the design and the plan and the schematics of it and how we were going to do something on a certain day in order to accomplish it that day so we can move on to the next phase of the construction project. or in my situation, you know, sometimes when I was a network engineer, the next phase of the rollout or the implementation of our um, information systems that we were we were um, constructing inside the casino or wherever it was that we were doing it, you know, one phase might be, you know, doing the um, cabling. You know, we'd set the cables out, you know, and get that ready for when we were going to connect to the servers, but the servers weren't there yet, you know. And the, server room didn't have the air conditioning yet, so we wouldn't bring the servers in yet. We wouldn't bring them online until we had the air conditioning set up and we were inspected and everything went according to the process of getting approvals from the state in order to be compact with them so that we would have our internal control standards set in place as we progressed from stage to stage to stage to stage as we began to develop all the implementation and rollout of a network engineering project that would eventually become what you see as a casino. You know, because most of the casinos you see 
Believe it or not, they're just video monitors. Yeah, really. That's all they are. They're video monitors hooked up to a server. They're just like having a computer at home. Really. That's all they are. I know. I set them up. <laughs> and you can adjust the percentages. <laughs> oh, boy. But there was always a procedure you had to follow in order to do that. The reason being, sometimes security, sometimes other reasons, you know. But the point being is simply, you needed to review at times the planning or the process or the development or the progress so you knew what to do each day that you were doing it. That's a lot like what devotionals are like. God knows you're going to read a devotional. So he says, hey, I know Joe's going to read that devotional today. So I'm going to kind of plan on having him notice something special in that devotional today. It's going to kind of grip his heart or pay attention to him. It's going to remind him that maybe he stepped out too far and he needs to step back and take a look at the instructions again. He needs to reevaluate why he's doing something and why he's gone too far without me because he's been religiously doing something as opposed to asking me if I really want it done. I personally have seen more work done that probably shouldn't have been than actually things that are inspired by God. That's just the way people are. Lots of times they build something and sure enough, you know, within a week or two, either tear it down, use it for something else, or move out of it. Maybe you've seen the same. You know, you see something that's built to last, like the Titanic. Built to last. It's going to sail the seven seas. It'll last forever. And on its maiden ship voyage, bam, sinks like a rock. Well, <laughs> the planning was there. Yeah. The purpose for what the planning was was there. Yeah. It was designed right. Yeah. You know, it served its purpose. Yeah. Did it accomplish its purpose? No. <laughs> because no one planned on getting hit by an iceberg or running into one. So, part of our lifestyles that we choose to live sometimes needs to reevaluate our planning stage when we're not operating according to the experience that God has in knowing what's coming in the future for us. That's why we take a step back. That's why we stop to consider what we're doing. That's why we have, believe it or not, a Bible. To reevaluate our life choices, to reevaluate our faith, to really kind of decide, wait a minute, this ain't working out. And sometimes people do that and they find at the end of their life, you know, they've been living kind of a religious life without really knowing Jesus at all. What a bummer to waste so much time and energy on everything else and not know God. I don't know about you, but I hate wasting time. I'm one of those kinds of people that, whether it was in a job, if I was hired by somebody, I wanted to get it done as fast as I can, as quick as I can, as skillful as I was able to do it within the parameters of the time frame that I was given. And more often than not, I always beat my goals, I always accomplish my purpose, I always met beyond the expectations of the person that hired me those things that they didn't think someone like me or me myself in whatever capacity it was could do. I exceeded. And I liked it. It was a challenge for me. Sometimes exceeding what God wants you to do isn't a good thing. Sometimes God wants you to not go beyond what He's told you to do but to wait on him to see how he will bring it to pass and accomplish his purpose. Because when you work for a foreman or you work for a CEO or you work for a millionaire like I have or you work for, you know, in some type of administrative capacity or you work for, you know, as a common laborer and, and I have done that, you know, it's just a common laborer. What the boss tells you to do, that you do. You know, I remember on my last job I was a, a journeyman boilermaker. And because we were non-union, they would tell us to do a certain job, and that was it. We stopped doing the job when the job was done, and that was it. Didn't matter how long it was scheduled to take, didn't matter what was left over, bingo. You do that job, and that's it. Stop until the foreman tells you the next thing to do. Because with their type of 
union rules you were not allowed to do other things or go on what the job requirements and the specifications stated so there were times i was sitting around getting paid twenty twenty five thirty five bucks an hour to do nothing <laughs> not the most brilliant planning in the world in my mind but hey i was not paid to do the thinking i was paid to do the obeying and you see sometimes that's what jesus meant when he said to obey is better than sacrifice you can get out there and work your tail end off sweating and doing and working it and trying to manipulate this and you know kind of argue with that and you know make everybody try to listen to you you know and try to force you know somebody's you know idea down someone else's throat you know kind of like you know you see sometimes some evangelism is that way you know some people like to go out there and do confrontational christianity where they seem to want to you know beat someone to death with the bible i don't know about you but i thought the bible was instructions you know it's kind of like a blueprint for life and you know i, I don't know about you but I, you know, when I see somebody that, you know, doesn't know what they're doing, I say, hey, look, check this out. This works. You know, if it doesn't work for you, don't do it. But if it works, great, try it. Check it out. See if it works. Other people, they like to kind of like, you know, maybe use it as a hammer when it really should be used as an instructor. So I don't know. You know, maybe that's just me. But maybe it's like you too. Maybe you don't like to waste time. Maybe you don't like to waste your energy. Maybe you're getting older. And you kind of like to do like I like to do kick back, take it easy, enjoy what you see around you. Maybe you like to rest in what's been accomplished. Maybe you kind of like to watch tomato plants grow or like these blossoms you see behind me. Maybe you like to kind of appreciate them for a while instead of like, you know, trying to make more grow or less or trying to, you know, beat these plants into growing when it's only, let's see, what month is this? It's not even really spring yet, but the season hasn't come for them to blossom, so I've got them growing ahead of time. Maybe I just need to let them grow in their season, and they'll produce as they are led by the environmental circumstances of warmth of sun, plenty of water, dirt, and everything else, and then once they've grown right, they will blossom and everyone can enjoy it. Maybe sometimes that's what you and I need to do. To take less care about what we think we should do and more time to stop and listen to what God would tell us to do. And that's kind of what Tozer says today. He says, the early disciples burned with an inward fire in whom Though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. If there is any reality within the whole sphere of human experience that is, by its very nature, worthy to challenge the body, the charm of heart to bring the total life into a burning focus, it is the reality that revolves around the person of Jesus. If he is who he says he is, and what the Christian message declares him to be, then the thought of him should be the most stimulating thought you could have in your mind. You would be amazed by just thinking at times of Jesus. We used to sing a song that said, you know, kind of went, Jesus, 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 you know, it was like Bill Gaither's. And they said, there's just something about that name. And you know, I find that true in life, you know, you just say, Jesus is boy, people are like either you know, one way or the other. They're upset, not upset. They're into something, they're into that, they're into this, that, and the other thing, and they're all over the place. Why would one name react to such dramatic ways unless there was something about the person himself that caused that reaction? I see it all the time. I'm amazed. I'm like, okay, don't talk about him. I don't care. <laughs> but you see, God dwells in a state of perpetual enthusiasm. He is delighted with all that is good and lovely concerning, let's see, wow, this sense. He is delighted with all that is good and lovingly concerned about all that is wrong. That's kind of an interesting way of saying it. No wonder the Spirit came at Pentecost as the sound of a rushing mighty wind and sat in tongues of fire on every forehead. In so doing, he was acting as one of the persons of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. 
manifesting himself with the wind. Is he the wind? No. But by his presence coming, the wind was there. Is he fire? No. But by his presence in those people, it was manifested to be seen as those by tongues of fire. Whatever else happened at Pentecost, one thing cannot be missed was the sudden upsurging of moral enthusiasm. Those first disciples burned with a steady inward fire. They were enthusiastic to the point of complete abandonment. They wanted to know more, they wanted to be more, they wanted to experience more of God himself. I like that. That excites me, you know. That's kind of where I would like to have my, you know, devotionals take me. I would like to have my devotionals kind of like remind me, you know, like, oh yeah, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about religion. It's not about doing the right thing. It's about knowing the right person. Because you see, it's kind of like in life, if you get there to this point, I don't know if you'll agree with me or not, but you know, I've been around some pretty expensive, okay, pretty well and connected people at times, or near them. And it's really not a lot about what you know as much as it is who you know in business. Because who you know gets you a lot farther than what you know. Quite frankly, most of the time, when I have met people that were in charge of things, it wasn't what they knew, but it was who they knew, because they would take people that were craftsmen and bring them under their wing, and they would be the CEO of them. They would be in charge. They would make sure they had a good team that produced, but they would be the one in charge. And that's usually the way people that make lots of big money do. They find someone else who does the work while they kind of like assemble the team and keep them focused in on the direction that it should go. Steve Jobs, as an example, wasn't the person who necessarily made everything, but he had the idea and then he formulated the team and he made sure and drove that team to the accomplishment of the purposes that he had in his mind and wasn't satisfied until he saw that physical entity come what he imagined in his mind to be. He was very successful at that. Other people like Steve, uh, like Bill Gates or any other type of businessman isn't necessarily the person himself who did it, but using those people and things around them to focus them in the right direction. And that's what I found about not needing to know everything there is about Christianity, but needing to know who Christianity was about. You see, when I first got saved, I didn't know nothing. I, didn't, I never got raised in Christianity. I didn't have any Bible background. I hadn't been to church. I'd never been to a church. You know, it's kind of like, well, that's cool. What is it? <laughs> you know, so when I went to Bible, uh, when I went to Bible, when I went to a Bible concert, you know, I got saved. God, as weird as it was, gave me some supernatural knowledge right off the bat. You know, it's kind of like, Ooh. And I told my sister that, she didn't believe me, and she still doesn't. I said, honey, you know, honey, I said, sis, you know, I said, I really haven't learned a lot of anything new. God seems to have spoken to me at the time I got saved, you know, I, I really am regurgitating things that, you know, somehow I knew, you know, it was like, I don't know how I knew it, but I was spitting out, you know, scriptures and saying things, you know, about, you know, you, today's the day, salvation, hard not church, says provocation, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then, you know, I was giving a little tiny New Testament, so I was reading that, but really, I knew a lot more than... <laughs> dare I say of my peers and that was just not me believe me I, I'm not stupid I'm just some dumb kid you know? but the interesting thing is that because of who I fell in love with God always gave me more than I actually knew because of who I knew Jesus he would always take me to places and things that I would learn more than what maybe was being taught in every circumstance of my life I would always discover and be revealed more than what was obvious to some of the people around me. And it wasn't because I was so smart that I could see it. I didn't have any clue what was coming. Matter of fact, I was like Jacob at times, you know. Man, I didn't know the Lord was in this place. But I was always looking for who I knew everywhere I went. I was looking for who I wanted to know in everything that happened in my life. And as my life began to develop, from the early days of being saved, I began to see God was in every part of my life. Because I could see Jesus in everything I did, even in sin. 
If I sinned, Jesus was there. If I was, you know, like exalted, you know, like for some reason put into some position of responsibility or authority, Jesus was there. You know, if I went to a Catholic church or I went to, you know, a Greek Orthodox church, Jesus was there. I just couldn't figure this out. You know, Jesus was everywhere. Because he was wanting me to appreciate him for who he was, not the religion that I was looking at for what they were doing. A lot of times I would see things they didn't even see. Imagine that. Maybe I was, you know, like delirious. Yeah. But being serious, all I can say is that it will always be inside of Christianity a blessing for you if you re recognize and realize it's not what you know, but who you know. And eternal life is always going to be defined by who you know, not what you know. So you may think you got to go out and get, you know, like a Bible college degree, or you got to go out and do a Bible school, you know, or you got to do this, that, or the other thing, you know, and kind of be able to genuflect and reflect and, you know, do the homiletic, hermeneutic routine, you know, and kind of get all these weird, weird, weird words, you know, to make you think that you're important when really it doesn't matter what you think you know, you know nothing at all because God said it, you know, so the only thing you really need to know is who you know, because if you know Him, then He will speak to you and His voice, you won't mistake for any other voice because you only know the voice of your master and you only follow him because Jesus said my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they want to follow the voice of another so all you got to do is kind of focus in on who you know rather than what you know and you don't have to worry about what you don't know imagine that when I was talking about the design and the purpose you know like of building a house I was always interested was like I would go to you know like I was working on a construction project one time and you know it was out in Palm Springs and they were doing a renovation and I was going as a framer and uh, or no as a taper I was going as a taper and uh, yeah I'd drive. it was funny it was a long drive I remember that boy young kid you know but I was out there as a taper and uh, you know we would do the we would do wet uh, wet smooth not dry smooth you know wouldn't sand it down but we'd wet smooth because it was kind of like a delicate project anyways while I was on that project I would look around and see other people working, you know, plumbers, they were there because they were doing their job, you know, and it was kind of like a renovation of some of these, uh, at that time they were just really motels, they were being renovated into resorts, but anyways, um, I would watch them, you know, I'd talk to them, you know, we would kind of like, you know, notice each other and notice things that we were doing, you know, and I was always one of those types of people that was interested in what other people were doing, not nosy, just curious, you know, because I would notice who knew what they were doing and who didn't. You know, some of the craftsmen that were there and some of the ones that were just day laborers. <laughs> and it was real obvious. Although sometimes day labor knows what they're doing. But I would ask questions and learn some of what they were doing so I could better appreciate the full volume of all that was going into the renovation project. And that's kind of what we do when we come to church because we begin to appreciate each other in our own unique way for the type of skills that God has used in each one of us to bring a different perspective or understanding of our life process that we call Christianity, believe it or not, and whether or not the person that you're learning from actually knows who he's talking about or he only knows what he's talking about. I took that lesson from that project way back when and applied it to my life so that everywhere I go, I'm very intuitive as far as looking at and listening to what people say. And I'm always interested to hear whether they're talking about the what, the wherefore, or the who. Because Horton may have heard a who, like Dr. Seuss says. I'm looking to see who you are talking about. Because if it's something that you're only talking about what you're doing and why, I'm really not interested. But if you tell me who, and you start talking about Jesus, believe it or not, even like my devotional, you got my attention because it will burn in me. I'll get all excited. I'll get all wound up. Ooh, he's talking about Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about I know that guy. You know, I know him. Yeah, I met him too. You met him? Yeah, cool. What was it like? What did he say to you? And you know, it was interesting.
this last Sunday, as cool as it was, and as wonderful as I enjoyed it, sure enough, <laughs> God wanted me there. And the reason why God wanted me there was because He just wanted to affirm for me the same thing I've always believed in, the same thing that I like to say, but He said it in a different way that the pastor was able to bring out in a wonderful teaching that I enjoyed. I just went, yeah. And I told my wife, I said, you know, I've come here three times and I don't have anything to say. You just kind of grin and go, yeah, isn't it cool? <laughs> you know, that's when God is using a man and using a man to demonstrate his grace and mercy through him in order to reveal his son and what Jesus would say to us each as individual people. It's when people do that that I just sit back in a pew and I just enjoy it. I don't I don't come up with anything I disagree. You know, it's like happens rarely because everybody I've ever met, I can see kind of where they're coming from because they're usually not talking about who. They're talking about what and where they're gonna go after the service or whatever they're gonna do, you know, down the road. Me, I'm a boring Christian. I'm very boring. Matter of fact, I've been talking all this time, you know, you're probably bored so because you know, the one thing I want to talk about, most people don't. And what I want to talk about that most people find really not that interesting, but I could talk day and night about <laughs> is Jesus. Yeah. It just blows my mind. It's just so good. It just gets better and better. I don't know. 39 years now and I haven't stopped talking. My wife wonders if I'll ever shut up. Because she knows that once you start talking about something else, you probably lose my interest. But God help you if you start talking about Jesus. Because you've got my perfect attention. 